Hello, hello, how is everyone doing today? This is Political Gridiron, and I'm Bill Maloney. Unfortunately, Pat McGuire is not going to be with us today. Pat, once again, is on the DL, so to speak. He has an injury, I guess, in his brain, and, uh... Thanks, it's okay, thanks, Benzino. And, um, he's having a CAT scan, or he already had one, and today, actually, he has strep throat, so I guess he has an injury all over his body. But we do have a lot of news to cover politically today. And thank you to everyone who is watching. Uh, thank you to my grandfather who is watching. Um, he, I know he's an ardent supporter of my uh, radio shows, Bill and Bob and Political Gridiron. So thank you, Grandpa, for watching. Thank you to everyone who else is watching. But first up today, I'd like to talk about Rand Paul's announcement that he's running for president of the United States of America. And, um, Rand Paul is an interesting case. He's definitely not his father. We can talk about him politically. Rand Paul actually wants to be taken seriously. But it's really interesting how he approaches his political beliefs. He isn't necessarily a conservative. And he definitely is not a Democrat. And I think that perhaps the most uh, accurate description of him might be a libertarian, but... Is he really libertarian? There are instances there are instances where he doesn't necessarily come off as libertarian. I mean, he just comes off as someone who is far right, such as myself, but other times he comes off as someone who is a liberal and really doesn't espouse the libertarian belief. But Rand Paul, I think, is gonna have to really, really offer a decisive choice to America. And he's going to have to explain to America why his whole libertarian philosophy really matters to the American people. And I think that he um, he's an interesting choice, a choice that actually a lot of young voters and minority voters actually do agree with. And he even says so himself that we could transform this election as a party in terms of who we get voting for us in the electorate. And he thinks that the Republican Party, I'll bite we, we might not get. Um, half of minority voters voting for us in this election. There's no reason why the Republican Party does not get a third of voters voting for them. I think that is something that I can agree with. I don't think that there's a reason why the, the Republican Party, one of the two larger parties in the country, shouldn't be reaching out to minority voters or um, voters that go beyond just being um, wasps, so to speak. And um, I think that the Republican Party has to go explain why conservatism matters to others. Um, Rand Paul, Rand Paul, many times people see him as the um, antithesis or the arch enemy of um, Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz, who, who is, at the same time, Ted Cruz does, does come across as... Um, as a very fiery speaker as Rand Paul, but Rand Paul approaches it from a very different light. Rand Paul says, no, 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 no. We don't need all this all this military and all this stuff. What we need is someone who's going to be more relaxed. Rand Paul seems like the, the careless uncle in many instances, but at the same time, the uncle who's going to go say to you, no, what you did is wrong. This is what we're going to do after he already has all his fun. And um, personally, I don't really agree with Rand Paul. I think... I think that Rand Paul is a little weak on some issues. I think that he's weak on the same-sex marriage issue. And um, I think that he's weak also on military and military spending. He says he wants to cut the military. And I think that he's also... I don't know if he's far out there, but I think that he does a lot of stuff just to um, nobilize his political cause when he talks about editing, auditing the Fed and other stuff. I think that... Um, Rand Paul really, if he wants to be taken seriously, he has to offer a path to nomination that's going to go represent the base conservatives that are going to matter in this election. And he's also going to have to go offer a path to nomination that's going to resonate with the people on Wall Street as well. And I think that overall when we talk about the Republican political field, and also the political field of the Democratic Party as well, we haven't seen a candidate that has said, I'm going to represent everyone. That I'm going to represent the people making millions of dollars. And I'm going to represent the people making a 
few thousand dollars a year or people making no money. And you can say all you want about Barack Obama. But Barack Obama, not in terms of policy, definitely, but in terms of how he spoke in 2008, he spoke as if he was going to represent everyone. And um, that change was going to be a united change for everyone. And um, I think that Hillary Clinton, when we talk about her from the Democratic perspective, she's going to have to stop her whole tone on we were poor and, you know, you have to go respect us. When Miss Clinton, you are the former first lady of the United States of America, I don't really know if you guys were struggling that bad. If you want to call a spade a spade, the real issue was that your family had lots of lawsuits from Whitewater and uh, the Rose Law Firm and the Monica Lewinsky sex scandal. So that's where the whole issue was. But I think that Hillary Clinton, she definitely offers a powerful message for women and for um, other people, people of um, diverse backgrounds. Uh, the LGBT community loves her. But also... Um, I don't, I don't really um, know where else Hillary Clinton runs to in terms of uh, where she's getting her message out to. And also, when we look at Rand Paul and a lot of people on the far right, they're driving in one lane, so to speak. And I think that this is a good analogy, that they're driving in just one lane. And if you want to win the race to the nomination, not the party, you're going to have to find a way to get one lane and then part at very minimal of another lane. So Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz has the Tea Party base down. But he also has threats to the Tea Party base from Mike Huckabee if Mike Huckabee t uh, decides to go run. And Mike Huckabee tends to be in that Tea Party. I'll bite not as much as Ted Cruz is because Mike Huckabee tends to be a little um, moderate on some issues such as education and immigration but you're going to have to go make sure that you come over to another lane whether that lane is the Tea Party and the socially conservative lane lanes and Ted Cruz if he wants to move over to the, to the socially conservative lane he's going to have to do more than tapping the anger of people really tap the values of people and he's going to have to reach out to more uh, Christian voters and Judeo Christian voters and really talk about not what gets them angry, but what really matters to them. And um, I, I think that the Republican Party, and, and also when we talk about Ted Cruz, I think that's a good analogy to the Republican Party as a whole. We have to stop being the party of being angry. We have to start being the party of really why conservatism flourishes in society and why it really matters. And we have to stop saying, oh, this is what's wrong with America. No, we have to celebrate the differences in America and say we're going to go make America work together. And I think that that is a um, very interesting aspect that Rand Paul offers to the race for um, President of the United States of America. Uh, covering the race in general, we have heard news that Hillary Clinton will be running for president. Um, well, that's old news, but... It hasn't been announced formally yet. And for that formal announcement, um, it's supposed to come in the coming weeks. Hillary Clinton has already signed a lease on uh, office space over in Brooklyn. I think over by Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn. So for all those campaign staffers of her that are living on uh, the couches of family and, uh, and their ex-boyfriends and girlfriends, they'll actually be able to go do their office work somewhere else and get out of Starbucks for a change and you know the baristas won't be looking over their uh, shoulders so to speak at their campaign details uh, I, I think that that really when we talk about the whole news that Hillary Clinton is um, buying office space in Brooklyn a lot of people say oh that's not news at all well you know infrastructure both in terms of who's staffing the campaign and where you're really running the campaign out of, that's um, influential and really paramount and imperative to any campaign. A campaign has to know where the campaign headquarters is. Many times I've been on campaigns and you don't know where the campaign is. 
you don't you don't know if the campaign's running out of this place or the next place or whatever. And that's very important to any campaign. And I was reading an article in New York Magazine where they said that Hillary Clinton, she might not be a great campaigner, but is it really um, an issue that matters anymore in America? Where in America, you're going to have these two political parties and you're going to have the people that vet the nominee, the eventual nominee, and they're going to go, of course, not everyone's going to go be as charismatic as Bill Clinton and John F. Kennedy, but they say that at the very minimum, everyone's going to be capable of being elected. It's just a matter of getting their message out. And I think I read an article by, by David Brooks of the New York Times that says this as well, something very similar, and he says, you know, everyone isn't going to be Abraham Lincoln, and everyone isn't going to be as um, philosophically grounded, and as intelligent, I'll bite, and although Mr. Lincoln did not get a formal education, and he w really wasn't that diverse in his readings, he read the King James Version of the Bible, a very powerful book, the most powerful book out there, and he read a lot of Shakespeare, and um, some uh, some not, not as widely read readings as well, and he was more about uh, understanding the depth of issues instead of the grasp of it, the depth and grasp of issues instead of really having a whole realm or diverse um, understanding of a lot of other issues that would be a little briefer than the context he uh, arrived at by really focusing on um, less of subjects but with more knowledge. And I think that. Hillary Clinton, she might say, oh, campaigning doesn't matter, campaign skills don't matter. But of course they do. Of course they do. And especially at the presidential election where people really aren't going to understand your policy, so to speak, as well as they might understand at the town level, where in the town level you're able to say, okay, it's black and white, this person wants to do this with the town and community pool. Whereas on the federal level, and with the nationwide campaign, you know, everything's uh, construed and constructed by different people. And your original message has been alternated about a hundred different times before you're even able to go leave the podium and move to the next campaign event. I think that it's not really at the federal level about what you're saying, but it's more about how you're saying it. And a lot of people, they really care about that. And... The uh, the whole point of the message, and this is the refutal on my behalf of the New York Magazine, is that if you don't have a candidate who's able to go articulate a position that's going to go get the people and the spirits of America going, then how do you really expect to win? And we've seen the power of having candidates um, who are able to talk to the people of America and how powerful that can be. We've seen that Barack Obama in 2008, dark horse candidate, he articulated a position that many Americans empathize and sympathize with. And we also see on the other half, where you have someone like John McCain going up against Barack Obama or you have Mitt Romney going up against Barack Obama or you have um, Bob Dole going up against Bill Clinton or George H.W. Bush going up against Bill Clinton. That just doesn't work out. And Hillary Clinton, for the this time, it actually might switch over to the Democrats not having the uh, charismatic candidate. Hillary Clinton, if she is just someone who says, okay, it's my time to have my chance of power, then that's a mistake on her behalf. It's a tragic mistake on her behalf and Hillary Clinton won't be able to be, be president of the United States because ultimately and we've seen this with the success that the Democrats have and their espousal to this own belief is that Democrats and ultimately Americans I believe this too they don't like to fall in line they like to fall in love with their candidates and that's part of the reason why the Republican Party has not done so well 
the Republican Party has said, okay, it's the next person's chance. We saw it with John McCain when he lost in 2000 to George W. Bush. And people were like, okay, this is John's time around. And the same when Mitt Romney lost to John McCain in the primary. It's Mitt's time. It's uh, Willard's time, so to speak. It's Willard's way. Willard's way. And um, I don't think that Hillary's going to have her way this time around. She just f expects the people of America to fall in line. And more than ever, this whole issue of people just falling in line has become... Um, a stain on her campaign where she just expects the people of the United States of America to basically just say, okay, it's your turn and we're going to have a royal dynasty. No. Hillary Clinton, America is not a regal corporation. It's not a regal country. And America does not like saying, okay, this is who we're going to have and this is how it's going to be, blah, 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 blah. No, America likes to say, okay, show me what you got. Show me what you got. And we'll see if you have the stuff to be president of the United States of America. And if you don't have the stuff to be president of the United States of America, okay, go back to Chappaqua. Check your emails. This time you can have as many emails as you want. You'll be a private citizen, and we'll have someone who can. I think that when you look at the Republican Party, they do have a cluster of candidates that do actually, um, actually, um, come come to uh come to grips with the American people and all the sentiments that they harbor. And such candidates would include Scott Walker, who I do not like because he believes that professors should be making the same amount as baristas at Starbucks who are brewing your coffee. And if you think that any professor would ever respect that position on behalf of Scott Walker, you have to be kidding me. I know my own father, who's a professor and he says, I'll write myself in before I, votes, before I vote for Scott Walker. And that whole position by Scott Walker is arbitrary. And it's just another way that we see the, the politicians not being leaders, but rather political calculators here in this um, 21st century here in America, where people will just read polls and they say, okay, we're going to attack academia. And I, I think that that's a tragedy. Also, who else do we have? on the Republican Party that really offers um, a message that uh, is received by at least some portion of the American people. We have Marco Rubio. Marco Rubio tells a story of um, being a, the son of Cuban immigrants. And I think that that's a heartwarming story. And a story that um, many Americans can relate to, especially where we have an influx of Latin American people and Spanish uh, people of, and people of uh, Hispanic descent here in this country. But when you look at the story, what happens with Marco Rubio's story is that there were Cuban nationalists, the people that Castro, who we thought was good at a time actually, um, went to overthrow. And these Cuban nationalists, what they did is they basically... And this is the same story I was talking about in my last segment. And what happened is that Cuban nationalists say, okay, we're going to go steal all the money from banks and from the cane fields and the sugar fields and from the mines and whatever you got, we're going to steal and we're going to make you work. And they're basically encouraging slavery in Cuba. And once you hear that story from Marco Rubio, that really isn't a story that I can really... Uh, understand because all, all you are is a Cuban nationalist and this country doesn't like nationalists at all. This country likes people that really understand the value of hard work that um, espouse the American dream and understand that if you work hard you're going to get paid one day. If you work hard you're going to realize the American dream and there are two candidates out there that I believe that understand this principle of hard work um, being necessary for success, and such candidates are the governor of the state of Louisiana, Bubba Jindal, and also Dr. Ben Carson, who is who who was the head of um, the pediatric neurosurgeon department at Johns Hopkins University, 
um, hospital over in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, which is one of the greatest hospitals, if not the greatest hospital in this country, and perhaps the entire world. And I, I'm I'm excited for my parents. They're going to go see Dr. Ben Carson uh, later this month, and hopefully I get a chance to go see them as well. Uh, tickets are a little pricey, but as my parents say, as my parents say, um, Dr. Ben Carson is one of the only people that I would spend three hundred dollars to go see. So, if I can buck up some change and uh, perhaps take a hammer to my piggy bank and go three hundred dollars, then I might be going. But if not, I'm happy for my parents that they're going. And I guess this is a little plea for my parents to help me out with that effort of mine uh, to go see Dr. Ben Carson. Um. I think that Ben Carson, um, a, a lot of people have been hearing about him in the news and all the stuff he says, and people say, oh, it's too radical for us and everything. No, Ben Carson is not too radical for us. And sometimes, you know, people need some radical. And I think that Chris Christie, who we don't even get to in this discussion about the Republican nomination, he at some point offered this theme of, we're going to have someone who's going to be a leader and who's going to step up to the plate and who's actually going to offer some real change. Chris Christie, his leadership backfired on us, on him at least, and the people of state of New Jersey, people of the state of New Jersey, when he decided he was going to be so much of a leader that he was going to take uh, George Washington Bridge into his own hands. Well, that certainly closed down a lane for him, at least for the moment, a little delay right there. And, uh, looks like Christopher's gonna have a little time for himself after 2016 in New Jersey or wherever he decides to go. So, and Bobby Jindal, I, I, uh, I think that Bobby Jindal is an interesting case. A lot of people, they say that Bobby Jindal in, they say that Bobby Jindal, they, they've disappointed him. And these are people on the left who are saying this, but... What they didn't understand was that Bobby Jindal, he was developing himself. He was developing himself back when they didn't like him. No, back when they liked him. And he eventually became the leader that is loved so much by the right. And that sort of leader, you know, he might have been a friendly guy at first, but right now, they don't seem as friendly. You got Benzino. And um, I think that Bobby Jindal really offers an alternative to all these um, wishy-washy Republicans that don't understand the importance of really espousing to your own beliefs and really saying what's important to the American people. And all these people that sacrifice their values for uh, political polls and etc., etc., etc. But... I think that this is enough on the issue of the Republican nomination and Rand Paul's announcement. And we'll be back with a little insight into Chris Bryant's case. If you aren't familiar, he's a player um, in the Chicago Cubs minor league system. And he's having a hard time getting to where he deserves. And uh, we'll talk about the whole issue of uh, McDonald's and their minimum wage debate. But for now, this is Political Gridiron. I'm Bill Maloney, and go Gales.